Welcome everybody to another episode of our RM Sub News Car Show. We've got a slightly different episode this week. We're going to do a video link with a very special guest, uh, Mr. Ben Collins, known to many as The Stig, the famous white suited helmeted Stig of Top Gear. Uh, we've been working a little bit with Ben uh, on some video content that we've been producing for some of our upcoming auctions. We did a series of nice little films with him uh, before our Le Mans sale earlier in the year. We've done some recent uh, uh, filming with him uh, with some great cars uh, in the build up to our London sale. And so we're doing because we're doing a little bit with Ben and he's got such a fascinating backstory as a racing driver, as Top Gear Stig, as a stunt driver in movies, in all sorts of things. We thought that you would uh, enjoy listening to this uh, short conversation that we've had with him, which I think you're going to find really interesting and really entertaining. And just to say, I'm going to apologise in advance. There was a little bit of a time lag um, caused by the internet connection during the recording. So uh, there, we do find ourselves talking over each other occasionally. So I'm just going to apologise for that. But in anyway, enjoy the episode. <laughs> Welcome everybody to RM Sotheby's Car Show and uh, we've got a special guest, very special guest actually, Mr. Ben Collins, who hopefully if you're watching this podcast, you can probably see him um, peering into his webcam because we're doing this, we're doing this remotely, which is uh, not something we do all the time on the car show. But Ben, I'm, I need to give you an introduction and it's actually quite hard to give you an, uh, to to summarize your career because it's quite broad, isn't it? Well, you'll um, have to come up with your, but with your best to... some say line. <laughs> well, it's racing driver, uh, top gear uh, personality, or at the time, actually, it's quite funny because at the time you weren't actually a personality, were you? You were just a you were just a, an anonymous figure on the screen. Um, I've got uh, exactly. Stunt I've driver, got no personality. Uh, presenter. <laughs> oh, it's a bit of everything. So come on, you. Um, started out racing way back what early mid 90s something like that yes um so that that's where the passion for driving came from and then subsequently you know get more and more into cars um as the years have gone by and how they work so um racing driver was the first calling and the main passion and that's that's kind of everything is spaghettified around that really i did a, did a little bit of research apparently you were in the you were in the army as well weren't you so yeah, so with um, I actually it was always an ambition of mine uh, when I was at school, and um, you know I didn't know where my career was going to go. It was only when I was nineteen that I started racing, uh, and I had a very you know particular goal in mind, which is get get to Formula One, um, to win races and um, get to the top. So that's a tough journey, and I, as in tough to get there. Um, it was a fantastic journey, and I loved every second of it, and um, you know completely hooked on motorsport. Uh, went through the different levels, you know, if you go faster and faster through the different series, all the way through Formula 3 and then into that Formula 3000 level and didn't quite make it to Formula 1. But I then went across to the Le Mans 24 hour racing and it was absolutely brilliant. It, that was the sort of peak of my career in terms of the speeds and the level of racing. Um, Le Mans 24 hours, World Sports Car Championship in a car that had Formula 1 engine powering it. So it had about 850 horsepower in the, in the Judd. F1 uh, V10 screaming motor and then carbon brakes, massive downforce. Um, so it was pretty epic. And and from that pinnacle, literally straight into the ground because uh, it was our, in the second year, that program was closed down and I could not get a drive anyway, even though um, I've been winning races and I'd been fastest at Le Mans over, outright in my category. Um, and I thought I'd done, you know, done well. There was just no drives. And I'd I'd, it was months of, of looking for a place to go. Um, and at that point, I, I sort of thought, well, I'm going to have to change careers and, and find something else. And, and that's when I signed up to do the Army Reserve. OK, right, right, right. OK, so go back, young Ben, teenager. Um, did you do the usual thing? Did you get going in carts? No, none of that stuff. Or so, did you, um, you go karting? Did you? Yeah, I grew up on the farm, so the the access to motoring was in a was on a quad bike, and um, I I was terrorising that machine for all it was worth, uh, for just for the sheer fun of it. Um, it was just a, something. I, it was great fun. It, it probably wasn't very fun for for the for the vehicle or my parents who were trying to keep you know keep this thing away from me and hide the fuel can and stuff like that. But that was a, a really interesting way of learning car control, and it it, it 
it sounds ridiculous, but it did put me in good stead when I ended up going back onto track or onto track for the first time to have a feeling of what the thing was like when it was squirming underneath you. Um, and then, you know, my hero, well, one of my heroes. I, I actually, yeah, quad, Vilna. A vi oh, yeah, absolutely. No, I, I, sorry to interrupt. All I was going to say is that quad bikes so no, are notoriously d deadly, aren't they? The number of people that have come a cropper on a quad bike and you've got to treat them with some respect, haven't you, if you're going quickly? I think you do. I, I've heard this more recently. Um, I, you know, I found it to be pretty drivable, but I had a, a sense of when it was going to tip over. Um, and uh and and you know the I, I feel like i'm giving people bad ideas if as long as you know when it's going to break traction and start sliding and you can you can feel that and you can get low uh i think that it's okay but you do need to build up to it and respect the fact that it can tip over and, and land on your head so yeah but at the time that wasn't a consideration <laughs> so it's, it, it's actually quite an unlikely start isn't it in motor racing because you're living on a farm your first kind of four-wheel experience is on a quad bike I'm assuming that maybe your parents, your dad doesn't have that much motor racing interest. So, so you're, you're kind of, you're not in a perfect situation, are you, to actually kind of get into a car and get onto a track and get started. So how did that, and, um, and more to the point, it needs money, doesn't it? So, I mean, yeah. how, did, 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 were you just sort of just keeping your parents poor or did, were you finding money elsewhere? I was in an incredibly fortunate position where my folks helped me get started. So my dad was passionate about cars and driving, um, it, you know, and he was uh, pretty wild at the wheel. So there was a there was an interest in the family, but I wasn't really into it until I had a go a, a bit of going go karting once, at a, you know, literally at a party. And then um, my dad gave me an opportunity to try a single seater, and then that was the game changer. And I was very quick. I had no idea what I was doing, but I was fast in the lap time. Um, and he helped me get started. So without that, there would have been there would have been no start to it. And and like you're right, it's a massive barrier. Um, the the cost of it. So I was fortunate to get some sponsorship fairly early on as well. Um, so that that got me going to a certain point. But it is a huge barrier. At least at, at least now there is esports as quite a good common denominator and a way of proving that you've got the discipline and the, and the approach. Yeah. And you can learn a lot of the um, sensory inputs. I think, uh, but it, actually a bit like go karting though. I would say more of the go karting translates to car racing than esports, but there is still a huge amount you can learn on on the sim that translates. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But form Formula Three was kind of where you first shone, right? Yeah, I, I mean, well, I shone for a lot of the wrong reasons early on. Uh, I, I had the speed, but I'd never been on a track <laughs> with other with other people. Um, I didn't get along with them very well. They were all in the way. But I wanted to be at the front, at the front, and I didn't have a very good risk calculator to figure out when it was a, when a move was on, when it wasn't. So, as far as I was concerned, all the moves were on all of the time, and so that lent that you know I meant I, I had a lot of crashing. And that's how you learn. You learn the hard way. Uh, but I was at the front, so mm. and, you know I won my last race of that season, and then I calmed down a bit and found a way to um, get to as in to finish first. You first have to finish. It's the golden rule. It's a for a novice. It's the most important rule of all. Uh, and to even out that and to be more disciplined in how you, you control yourself. So they did kick in pretty early. And then in Formula 3, yes, I was, I was again, I was up there. Um, and a lot of the people I raced with ended up in Formula 1, which was great for them. Um, I didn't make it, so I had to go do something else. But, you know, it was a great journey. So, so who, who were you competing against at, at that point who eventually made it to Formula 1? Go on, do, do yeah, some name the, dropping there. I'll try to think. So Mark Webber, um, that's a good tussles with him. Uh, did Mario Haberfeld get to F1? I can't remember. Um, Thomas Schechter became test driver at Jaguar, and then uh, Luciano Berti. Yeah. He was it. He made it through. So a lot of the Brazilian guys made it through. Uh, there's there's more of them. Um, Mark Hines got a test drive, um, yeah, but didn't get to F1 and it should have done because he was a you know, fantastic talent. Um, who else? To come to Kuma Sato. He was my teammate. Narain Karthikeyan. Yeah, yeah. I think he he did a few starts, didn't he? uh who else yeah i remember carter, carter Kayen did um uh he did palmer audi as well didn't he i think uh, he may I have done he did I Formula palmer audi yeah. yeah 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 i remember very fast watching. yeah no fast, all wild yeah <laughs> when i when i was racing in Vauxhall lotus he um i ended up with this driver we were there's mallory park is a very high speed track it was the first time all of us had really gone up to that level where we had big slick tires and, and wings on the car um so it was quite a big step and um yeah there was this driver and I was, it was a test day and we were banging wheels down the straight i can't remember who started it but i would obviously i would lay blame on him he would he would probably say that it, i was the hooligan 
but nevertheless there was this there was this driver he would not let me pass and it got it got all got quite larry and um we came into the pits and i was sort of looking across to see who this person was expecting this great big sort of thug to get out because of the way he drove and it was lorraine and tiny skinny guy really really small a helmet with matchstick legs um, basically um and it just it, you, you, it just made me laugh it just um his, his his driving attitude was was massive and he was you know it was just him and i got we became good friends i i really like narain he's a good guy you it's funny enough talking of so i'm 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 pretty small i'm five foot eight and and i've done a bit of racing but but one of the one of the good things about being five for eight is that you fit in everything i've never i kind of haven't found a car that i've not fat, um, sat in and it's been okay and comfortable and all the rest of it you're on the toolish side aren't you for a driver yeah i'm six foot one which is not ideal um it's also weight is a factor in a lot of these mm. formulas where um so when in the you know in the good series they they do they ballast so you, you've got a a weight that you have they'll add weight to the lighter drivers but mostly they don't do that so that's quite a disadvantage and in terms of sort of screwing yourself into these cars yes you're an f1 driver's dream uh me less so but fortunately there is just about enough room you have to figure it out but you end up with welts on your elbows and your knees from from wedging yourself in so it's it's a bit brutal yeah i i, I just lack a the skill and b the fitness as well that would be that would be my problem um years ago when i was a, a motoring journalist um the guy I worked with, Steve Sutcliffe at Autocar, he had the opportunity to go and he, it, Steve was a good peddler and was d driving in the TBR Tuscan series at the time and was doing doing pretty well in that and, you know, was winning races. And he had the opportunity to go and b drive the, the then Jaguar Formula One car. Um, and I mean, I think he equipped himself very well, but he couldn't string more than two laps together without his feeling like that his head was going to leave his body, couldn't lift his head up and uh, just absolutely knackered him. It's amazing how fit you have to be for that stuff, isn't it? Yeah, that level is quite a, uh, an awakener. F1 and and also that Le Mans car that I was racing was very similar. So even though I've been racing Formula 3, where there's considerable G-forces in the cornering, um, actually, but rarely you um, felt that you were getting a proper workout. Weirdly, there was one track on the calendar that we did at Po. Um, it's a street circuit in France. I, I'm not even sure what it is. I think it's just because there were no straights. So your, your body never got a rest. And you actually really, you really felt it in your neck and your arms. It was the only place. You go up to Formula 3000 level and F1, and it's a whole different ball game, and you have to transform yourself. Um, it's sort of one of the hidden secrets of motorsport. Uh, you can yeah, you can get away with a lot up until that level, and then you have to really commit to it. Otherwise, it's two or three laps, and then you, you physically can't, you can't turn the steering wheel fast enough and be in enough control to to keep on top of it so that and that was a bit like that on my first test day. i think i bluffed my way through um and got that drive when i drove for ascari but realized i was going to be spending three hours four hours in the gym per day um to get up to speed with it physically and um which is what i did it was an amazing challenge but the, we had no power steering everything was on your arms and neck um huge uh, th three three and a half g um braking cornering and the straights become very short because you just you're changing gear all the time the thing is just leaping along the straights you, you just you, they don't last long and then you're back on the you know huge effort on the brakes and it and when you hit the brakes it's not just braking it's it's the full force that your leg can deliver to that pedal it's as, it's as strong as you can you know hit it with your thigh muscle so you properly working yeah and, um yeah it's, it's great yeah it was a lot of fun okay so you found yourself in sports cars how many times have you done them all four times now Four times. And and that is, I mean, I suppose when at, at whatever point you kind of realised you weren't going to stay in single seaters and you weren't necessarily going to make it to Formula One, that that's the pinnacle, isn't it? If you're not driving a Formula One car and doing Grand Prix, Le Mans is the, is the pinnacle. So that it must be wonderful to reflect back on your racing career, having done Le Mans four times, uh, because it kind of doesn't get any better than that, does it? Yeah, I was very snooty about the whole anything that's not a single seater uh, for, for, and I think most r racing drivers are that way um, until until actually you get in one and you drive, uh, whether it's the new hypercar, which I've not yet driven, uh, or a Group C car, which I did get to drive with you guys, um, which was epic, um, you know, or the, or the LMP 900 or LMP1. They're so fast, the performance is incredible. And then you then you realise what you hadn't paid attention to, which is that there's an, another world of motorsport that's just as cool and fast. But you get to do it for longer. You know, sports car races are six hours. F1 is much shorter. F1 is still the, is the pinnacle of motor racing, but still, it's there's um, the grid is full of F1 drivers. 
So you're racing against some of the best drivers in the world, either who are on the way to F1 or just outside of it or have just left it behind. So the, the you're, it's top level sport and um, yeah, it's mega. And there's, and, and then you've got the different categories, obviously you've got GT racing as well. And I've, and I've, I've been at, you know, all of, I've driven all three levels, LMP1, 2 and GT. And they're, they're all great. I did prefer it in the faster stuff because you, you're not looking in your mirrors so much to see when these crazy things coming past you and going to slice your mirrors off, which does happen quite a lot. Yeah. Well, and as, as you just referenced, at RM Sotheby's, we've been working with you a little bit on, on some of our video content. And we, we uh, some of our listeners will be familiar with the fact that this year uh, we did an auction at the 100th uh, anniversary of Le Mans. And we uh, we did an auction there um, and some of the auction cars we went and did some filming with uh, on the short circuit at Le Mans. And uh, it was a good day, wasn't it? That was, uh, uh, well, we, Porsche 962. Um, uh, we had a Viper. We had the uh, Nissan R90 that Mark Blundell did that Banzai uh, quali lap in and all sorts of stuff. And some pre-war stuff as well. So, um, yeah. Uh, that was so was that the first so that those two group c cars that was the first occasion you'd gri driven a group c yes uh, that was a, a real pinch yourself day um it's hard to believe we've, we filmed all those in one in one go um getting in those cars that was very familiar to what i was racing um and i suppose some of them were well it was only a 10-year gap i suppose to the nissan so that had a lot in common with the Ascari. Um, in fact, the, that car, even the chassis, the Lolo, I think was based on a Group C car from a similar era. They cut the roof off basically and, and modified it and, uh, and turned it into an Ascari. So, yeah, it was it was familiar territory, but you you also acknowledge that it, it, the fearsomeness of the power and the speed and what they were, you know, it's fantastic. Um, and, and just a, an idea of what it was. I mean, the one that sticks the mem in the memory was Blundell's Nissan because of the berserk lap and the overboost and all that that turned i think it's because it was already an extreme car but on that on that lap unleashed with the turbos and the wastegate jam shut that um it became a completely you know off the off the richter scale insane car i think that's why people love that story but the rothmans equally you know that that porsche the 962 and everything it had done um in, in its various forms and evolutions it uh, was the car on my bedroom wall i'd watched derek bell or was it even even not following them on you kind of knew you knew that name he was a celebrity um in those days and so it was it was special and we had yeah, and the old timers that one that we had the um the alpine um the uh what is it was it called out yeah alpine yeah the, with the square the straight, wheels straight <laughs> yeah square at, at the bottom because it had been parked in a museum for several decades and hadn't been touched i think since it was um it finished le mans remarkable yeah, no, amazing. It's amazing. That, I mean, they, the days like that are the privilege of uh, of working for an auction house, really, like RM Sotheby's, because we do have access to some amazing cars. But I know that a lot of our listeners are going to be uh, fascinated by the Top Gear story. So let's let let's go to that first off. Very briefly, if you can, tell us how you came to be the Stig. Yeah, so I um, it was actually one of my I don't, one of my sponsors when I was doing Formula Three was Top Gear magazine. And so I, I and I was in touch with a little bit there and learning about what they were doing. But I also knew Top Gear from back in the day when Noel Edmonds used to present it. I think I was vaguely aware that he was on the TV. Top, but it's a household name. And, uh, you know, at, at the time I was looking for different. How can I get more sponsorship? How do I get to F1? You need, you know, you need backing. Um, and working in TV seems to be a good thing to do. A lot of the drivers were getting involved with different driving programs. Um, my mates were on a Channel 4 program. Plato was on Channel 5. Um, so there was... There were opportunities there and i thought right this would be a good thing to do and i, I was in i got in touch with the tv show is there anything going on here um and the timing was good because there was a, a there was a stig already there was um he, he was there for about eight or nine months yeah. which was perry, perry um, perry's yeah the blacks the stig in the black suit so they had someone there yeah. i didn't realize that he was on the way out so um so the as it turned out that was good fortune for me and uh not so much for him, I guess, unless uh, I, don't, I don't know the circumstances with that one. Um, but I was in touch. I got to do an audition at the track in a Ford Focus. And they had an existing time for that car, which I which I beat, but I didn't know that at the time. So um, my future boss was, uh, you know, monitoring this on a stopwatch um, and didn't really say yes or no to anything I was doing. I did my best. And then was that Andy uh, Wilman? That was and that's Andy. Yeah. The exec producer. Yeah. Kept his cards close to his chest as always, and always kept you kept you keen. 
Uh, so yeah, I didn't hear from them at all until for about a month, and then um, I got. I basically was asked, you know, can you come in on a Tuesday or something? And and I got there, and that was my first day as the Stig. Amazing. Okay, and so that. I mean, interesting that they gave you a Ford Focus because, um, I mean, I suppose pedalling a, a Ford Focus quickly around a track is as valid as, as anything else. But w once you found yourself in the job and there were all manner of cars coming your way and obviously a lot of them very powerful, did you feel pressure? Did it feel like a pressurised environment in terms of you? Um, everyone was expecting the Stig to get hold of whatever he was driving, you know, get it by the scruff of the neck and just go, Banzai fast and 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 pull everything together and look amazing. So did that did that feel like pressure to you? Well, there's or always pressure. So yeah, the, I mean, it was clever of them really to um, use a Ford Focus as a measuring tool because all these racing drivers who've done Le Mans and Formula One, we're, you're all used to rear wheel drive cars with lots of power and grip, and a Ford Focus is front wheel drive and has none of that grip, and it's it's a road car, and and Top Gear is is also fundamentally it's a it's a car show about road cars you do get some supercars and and hypercars that, that start to get close come close in terms of handling to um to a racing car but for the majority of it it isn't so that i think that was quite a smart move to see how, how right how does he how does a pro driver um react with this thing um and then mm -hmm. on the day to day that you with racing especially in the qualifying sessions you have to create that pressure yourself to find your peak performance for one lap when the tires are ready to do it uh, so that's something that I'd learned to cultivate in my you know, try and get to the, you know, again, to get that performance, to be ready for those qualifying sessions. You have to find it in yourself. And I just brought that discipline to the, to the stig role. And, um, and then some, because I did, I really loved this whole idea of this, that this character was flawless. No human being is, but I, it, it's what you aspire to. And I thought that was a pretty good banner to be under. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and I mean, you carried it off so brilliantly, actually, I have to say, and obviously your anonymity, was so much a part of the whole the whole thing. I mean, ju just before we get into the anonymity bit, um, how, so how many years in total were you were you the Stig? Eight years total. Eight years. So how on earth did you manage, and and did all of the production team and everyone else? You've got friends and family that knew you with the Stig. How the hell do you keep it a secret for for that amount of time? That just seems. That's like being in the SAS, isn't it? And not telling anyone what you do for a living. I mean, it, that's mad. It's fairly easy because you just don't tell anybody. <clears throat> and then um, you can't really go wrong with that. It's a simple rule. Once you've told one person, then that's it. They tell one person and then everyone knows. Yeah, for the first two years, I didn't tell anyone. It only it only became worth um, telling someone who I knew when uh, when they were, were going to find out anyway. So obviously my wife needed to know because I was, you know, you could, you're going to bring home this this white racing suit so what's that about um and um but but no outside of that the production team that you had people coming and going so and you have and, and eventually it was the it was the sort of admin and bureaucracy that kind of started to wear down a bit of that that veil of secrecy because you had to do insurance forms um and, and people come and go and, and ultimately the press did slowly start to find out and started guessing correctly what was going on but actually i always maintained that they didn't know until they had definitive proof but it did uh, there were a few things that that you could say were definitive so i was named in a health and safety report um at one point i think that was in 2007 and then i was i also got named unfortunately by the bbc's own radio times that um outed me as the stig in 2008 and that was then the, the slippery slope um once your own team is is doing it it very hard to defend We'll touch on the, on the on the outing of you as the Stig in a minute because I know that there was quite a lot of furor about that, wasn't it? I've just got one anecdote because in the early two thousands, I was working uh, kind of in a I was PR manager for Peugeot UK around the time. Uh, I'm trying to think what year it would have been, two thousand and three or something like that, and we had launched a new car. Uh, fairly crappy little thing, uh, but Andy Wilman quite liked it. It was a little car called a 1002, or was it a 1003? But it, it was a small car, but it had two big sliding doors in the side of it. Anyway, we were asked to bring it down to Dunsfold, um, and I came down. It's all a bit hazy because it is a long t it is 20 years ago. There were some porter cabins outside where you had the main hangar where the filming was done, but there you got changed in a porter cabin thing outside. Is that right? Is my memory serving me right? Eventually, so the, the um, originally it was the it was the pilots' changing room, which was the brick building, because it was the it was the test ground for the Harrier jump jet. 
and we used to use one of their buildings and then actually we, we moved across i don't know why but i then moved across to this porter cabin and we kind of slimmed down so that's where it, yes porter cabin um, well i was in that porter cabin um milling about um because i kind of knew a couple of i didn't really know jeremy clarkson but i did know uh james may i knew a little bit uh, cause, and he was an ex auto car guy and you know and i'd met ha uh, hammond a couple of times as well but anyway i was in that porter cabin and i don't know i don't know what happened or what i was doing whether i was looking for a toilet or or looking for somewhere to sit down or something but i i opened a door and i began to open it and i got the faintest glimpse of what must have been you but i didn't know it was you and i didn't really see your face and you um i don't know which direction you was you were sitting or standing but you were obviously aware that somebody was about to walk into this room and you just instantly in a, in a, in a nanosecond spun around and just slammed the door you like <laughs> like it just came back in my face like that i'm sorry but um but that i was i was no, 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 no it's no problem and I kind of, and, and in that moment, I knew what I'd done. I knew that the stig was behind this door and I, and I, it scared me. I thought, right, I need to get out of here. Um, but anyway, that, um, that's my, that's my stig anecdote. But so when you did eventually, as you say, sort of the, the veil of secrecy, secrecy sort of began to, began to fray a little bit. So, you, you know, y your name was being mumbled a little bit around and about, but in the end, Am I right in saying that actually coming clean and putting your hands in the air and being seen in public and saying, yes, I'm the stick, that was that was basically your decision. But that was a decision that didn't go down brilliantly with the uh, with the uh, the rest of the team. Is that is that a fair assessment? Yeah, it's close. I think, like I say, the it had been revealed to some extent with through various means um and uh and also i was getting rumors that, that you know that there were other people they were i just had a you know when you know you're going to be replaced so i was aware of that and um you know once you once you figured things out then you start having to make your own decisions so i've been there i've been there a long time i loved it um i, I never had a bad day, bad day at work every day was another adventure just it was fantastic great team um but i felt that the time was coming to the end and so i I'd been, I'd been in the press. It had been these different reveals. Schumacher came on and did a huge smokescreen thing, but to me, it was it was pretty obvious that the time was up, and it was better to go under, you know, with some element of planning for my own benefit as well as being making a clean break with it. So I did, you know, get my house in order and then served, you know, gave my notice to my boss and um, tried to do that as uh, in the most equitable way possible. But it did um it didn't go down particularly well and then there was a bit of a um a breakup and but anyway i'm glad we did make up in the end and um hopefully everybody got a bit of an, a bit of a perspective of of you know that there's a human being in there that also has a, a career to try and forge and other things to do so we did make up in the end and that was good yeah i i mean i think that must be so frustrating to be to be in one of one of the world's most popular kind of entertainment programs let's face it and to have such a central role within it and to be on the front of calendars and god knows what and dvd boxes and to not as ben collins to be able to kind of monopolize on that and in, and in, and enjoy it as as yourself and not as an anonymous individual in a crash helmet i totally get a sense of how frustrating that must have been and to have done it for all of those years so it must have been quite liberating when you were when you revealed yourself it, it was quite weird. So um, I think the, the only so the only issue I had with it was that um, I was always not not by my main boss, but I was there was the as it became very corporate, um, I would be quite continuously reminded that I was expendable, and that really grated because I haven't been there a long time and and I felt done a top job. I you know had to fend off lap times against some of the best Formula One drivers and and all these things, and I loved that. But yes, yeah, so mm -hmm. there was. It was just this that that they oh well we can't get rid of you because nobody would know that we got rid of you, um, we just replaced you. There was that there was that sort of hint, and um, so that was a little bit hard. And yeah. uh, so the and weirdly when I the, when the Radio Times thing happened and um, there was sort of, I was completely shocked because I'd done things like kicking doors closed and um, I'd had the Sunday Times break into my locker and go through stuff, but I'd already thought of that. I never carried my wallet with me with my anything with my name on it, so I was I was quite you know defensive and careful um but actually when i read it in print it was a weird it was i was surprised that i felt relieved um because it was a moment i knew would come and dreaded 
and did everything I could to prevent happening. But once it's happened, you can't you can't go back. Um, and it was I was surprised. I felt relieved because I was I suppose surprised that I was even um, worried about it. But you, it was the best job in the world. So of course you want to keep it going forever. Yeah, fascinating. That's really really interesting. Um, but life um, since being the stick has 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 been equally interesting and, and, and good for you. I mean, the other thing I kind of really have to touch upon for the benefit of the listeners is to talk a little bit about some of the film work you've done, in particular, James Bond. So which movies have you done stunt driving for? Um, you did a bit, you did, uh, Spectre? You did Spectre, is that right? Yeah, so my first Bond film was Quantum of Solace um, and then Skyfall, um, a tiny bit on Spectre, and then I worked on No Time to Die as well. So it's been amazing. The, the Bond movies are something else. It's a, another level. And going from a small team with TV, Top Gear, um, to this massive crew, hundreds of people, um, I wouldn't say that it's not that money's no object. It's just that they will invest in creating a timeless and perfect shot so that if it takes a week to get the weather correct for that scene, they'll wait. Um, they have time to, to, to yeah. afford the time to do it. Um, that was unbelievable. And the, and the toys are bigger. Yeah, so in our auction world, we've bought a few Bond cars to auction, and not not just sort of uh, you know Connery era DB5s. We but we've had some of the um, uh, some of the Land Rovers. Uh, they were Spectre, weren't they? The Land Rover, those yep. big crazy Defenders. Um, and um, what else have we had? Yeah, well, various things. Some of the cars from some of the Pierce Brosnan era as well. But they're not those those vehicles are never quite what they seem on the face of it, are they? So those Land Rovers, the the, the Defenders, they weren't just Defenders. They were they were very, very special, highly engineered bits of kit, weren't they? Well, relatively, I think. Um, So I don't know how much they really were. I didn't I didn't get involved on that scene with that with those vehicles. So um, I can't say that I'm an expert on them, but um, I think they were fairly rudimentary, what they, you know, but obviously with the, the way they, the, the styling with the massive wheels, the extra power and all that sort of stuff, um, that, you know, that was fairly um, a, a fair modification. I've got much more involved with Land Rovers in Skyfall because we had um, we had a podcast. You got the car, and then you have the driver, the stunt driver on the roof. So that was um, a lot of what I spent my time doing, and that is quite technical. And you've got because you've got to reroute all the steering, brakes, throttle, everything goes upstairs, and gear, gear changing mechanisms, the whole thing, and you control the truck from the roof, which is quite something. If you you know Land Rovers, you know they carry a bit top heavy and they want to roll around a bit. So that really accentuates that having that huge mass on the top with all the batteries, all the all the filming equipment, two cameras bolted to the sides. So we had to modify that quite a lot. Say so we, the, you, yeah. You, you were sitting on the roof of the Land Rover driving it while the actors were down in the in the main cabin. Mm, exactly. And you've seen how I drive, so you can imagine how they felt. But uh, it's <laughs> it's quite a know. thing. It's quite a thing. And so the yeah, special effects team, they modified the suspension. They, they widened the wheels to give it more stability. That, so that wider track um, meant that it stayed upright better and we could do things. But it had, you know, we had a handbrake, hydraulic handbrake for skidding it around. So it was quite a cheeky piece of kit, but, but great. Then we were flying that thing around the mountain roads and through uh, Istanbul. It was, it was good fun. That is very cool. So it, it, in, I mean, it's probably varied from movie to movie, but I mean, how many weeks would you be involved in, in filming for, for, for one of these films? Well, for those films, it's months, not weeks. So first film, I think Cosmo Solis was about three months, give or take something like that. And I think Skyfall, I was on that for three and a half, four months. So there's a, there was a lot of a huge amount of rehearsal time. So they really focus on running everything through very precisely. So they, and they can see then what they're going to get to make sure they get what they want and that it matches their storyboards and scripts. So there's a good build up process. And then you've got yeah, this big, big, big machine moving around the different locations. So, um, yes, so they're quite lengthy. Um, and then the, the recent one was a bit shorter for me. No time to die down. It's, uh, what's it called? That, that funny place. Oh, I've forgotten the name of it now, but anyway, in, uh, down in the South of Italy. Um, why can't I remember that now? Anyway, but mad streets with uh, very, very low grip surface. So they had to spray um, Coca-Cola on the surface to help the tires grip and bite into the the, um, cobblestones. So there's always a different challenge, but that's the whole, the beauty of these different locations is you get completely different vibe for the film, but for the driving, it's it's totally different as well. So I go from one track to another. Are they, if it's tight, wide, fast, up and down hills, loose surfaces, tarmac, it's, um, it's what, yeah, it's what keeps it really fresh. So what Matera. were you driving in No Time to Die? 
So Matera. So I did a couple of bits in an Aston, but not, not the, the bulk of it was done by a uh, different uh, with, by Mark Higgins, a rally driver who jumped in to do that. Uh, but I was like, in, I inserted in a few different places around in different bits of the chase and, um, and helped out in different ways. But, uh, yeah, I got to drive a, a couple of the little sequences in that, uh, and get to spend a fair amount of time in the rehearsal time, at least getting hold of the, that crazy stunt car, the, the DB five, which was epic. Yeah, yeah, that's amazing. I think there was a Maserati in that scene. Was it an old Quattroporte or something? I can't remember. Or is that just my yeah? There's a there's a few there's a few really cool Italian cars. So there's a I think there's a couple of old Maseratis that get written off. Um, there's a mad stunt where it where it flips over or or jump nearly jumps over um, Daniel Craig on that on the bridge. But um, there's some really cool stunts early on in the film. But as always, the great thing is that those the Bond movies are shot in camera real as opposed to cgi and i think that's what really hooks the audience in from the start to finish because it's um it's it's shot you 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 can always tell when something is a bit of fakery you can always sense it and i think it, it sort of knocks you back into reality a bit whereas you get fully immersed when you you know there's somebody there driving it or jumping off that bridge or doing something yeah no absolutely yeah uh, absolutely mega it's always a an event when a new bond movie comes out for sure so um bringing things bang up to date and we must um, wrap this up fairly quickly but you know what are you up to now you you've got your youtube channel i know you work you you work with manufacturers you're working with the likes of us with rm sotheby's so you're st you're, you're keeping yourself very busy yeah um so i'm still writing books um so that first one that came out some years back now the whole sort of summary of my top gear days the man in the white suit um up to more recently but wrote a book about aston martin um which has been fabulous because i did a ton of research on that one and a really deep dive into all the personalities behind the great cars and machines literally as some of them resurfaced like the bulldog um, um that's just come back to life um, the uh, one of yeah. them very special car by William Towns. So I really was lucky in my timing uh, because I was diving into these things and then the, these cars have actually come out and um, and also got to drive, you know, some of them with, with you. Um, so a bit of that still. And then on YouTube, that's that's really where I'm very focused now to, to I just love it. It's great. So I've got a channel called Ben Collins Drives um, where I get to, you know, I suppose in a way it's like Stig Unleashed. So I'm going out into the wider world now. I've got, I've escaped Dunsfold. Um, to go and drive a mix of racing cars, road cars, you name it, go and meet interesting people and terrify them and do that. And I've actually got a, a podcast too. So I've been going around meeting interesting people to talk about their car stories. That's called Some Say um, that launched this year too. So that's keeping me busy um, with the occasional bit of racing um, to keep me sharp, which I love. So I got out in a GT car this year. I've been racing for Praga um, and helping them with their hypercar, which is going to be, well, is is something special um, that's, that's just come out this year. So there's plenty of good high octane business going on. Yeah, that Praga looks amazing, I must say. Um, I used to work with Mark Harrison. He and I used to work. Yeah. The legend. Yeah, the legend. And actually, and because of both of the you worked in PR, the legend that's Mark. I wanted to bring you back to your PR career, actually. You did touch on on Peugeot earlier, which I think was one of the, one of the most com comedic moments on television and certainly the Top Gear history was Peugeot. When Peugeot, around your era, refused to give them the car that they'd reviewed. I, I, I don't know if it was the one you said, but I think it was a diesel estate. Um, and it was a PR decision not to give them the car for the studio. And this really pissed them off. So they made mention of this. Peugeot wouldn't give us the car, but we've got the best ne next best thing. And the camera peers down to the floor and there was a steel bucket of horse manure on the ground. And I, I thought that that was um, absolutely hilarious. I, yeah, I don't think I, Peugeot I, I, thought so, no, but it I, was funny. That was my decision. <laughs> a PR I disaster. Vague, I have got a vague thing. I know, I know. Well, you put me in charge of anything, you're going to get a disaster. That's <laughs> no question. <laughs> <laughs> um yes yes yeah no it's funny i mean th th there was a lot of caution at peugeot actually i have to say in in terms of it was a very funny situation at peugeot because uh back in back in the day sorry we're going a bit off we're going a bit off um uh off piste here but the peugeot 206 the the little super mini that a lot of listeners will remember was britain's best-selling car and it, it you know it, in the retail market so more people were spending their own money on buying a Peugeot 206 than they were on any other car on sale in, in Britain. Media hated it. They had not, nobody ever had anything good to say about the Peugeot 206. Nobody liked the driving position. They didn't like the way it drove. 
everyone could broadly agree it looked okay but but you know if you gave it to auto car or to express or top gear everyone would go i don't know why i don't know why people buy this car because it's terrible so in the end Peugeot stopped giving 206s to anyone it was like no we're not going to give you a 206 because we know we already know you're going to hate it but yeah it was a very strange thing Fair. That's it. That's what we get. But it was funny. And I guess, yeah, it's a, it's a funny, it's a game of cat and mouse with the, with media, but it's not, it wasn't your fault, but Persia, they do make some great cars. And, um, you know, and from where you're, you, you are now with the auction house, it's, it's, it's fascinating looking back now at what, um, what wasn't popular that's gone up in value, um, or what was popular that's really gone up in value and, you know, Persia 205 and things like that, that they're all these, all these sort of cult cars that yeah. people remember. Yeah, I mean, it's sad in a way that a lot of people of a certain age won't remember. I don't want to bang on about Peugeot. I was only there for two or three years, but I wasn't there during the time of the 205 and the 306 and, the, you know, the rally versions and the XSIs and the GTIs. And because um, they were they were absolutely mega, mega cars. And like so many cars, um, you know, they they get ragged by by mainly young blokes who get hold of them when they're second hand and then sort of basically destroy them and most of them are wrecks but the relatively well preserved cars you know fast forward 20 30 years and they are their collector's cars i mean that's the thing it's like subaru impressors and all, all sorts of stuff mm. finding a good one is the challenge if you can find a good one it's a yeah. very very good place to put some money because they're always going to be in demand I, I think that's an inspiring story too, because there are still there are modern classics. They're they're still occasionally percolating, and uh, you know, it's one for people to, to if they feel that that car is special to look after it. And you never know; it could be one that pops in the future. Maybe this is a topic for for a future podcast. We can talk about all the cars that people ought to be buying now for very sensible money, and yes. uh, twenty years from now, they'll they'll be grateful that they bought one. Exactly. Exactly. All right. Well, next time I'd love to do that because I want to know and I need to know what to look after and what's going to um, get hold of. So um, look, yeah. look after that. Well, space. look after your Porsche. Thank you. Okay, good. That's good to know. I will. I'm trying to look after it. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's a lovely bit of kit. Yeah. Look, Ben, we've been chatting for a while. Thank you ever so much. Thank you for your time. And um, I'm sure that you and I will be speaking again soon, but um, I'm not sure what you've got on for the wreck between now and Christmas, but I hope it all goes well and have a lovely Christmas, even though it's a few weeks away. And uh, thank you. Thank you for I'll, be, I'll be racing in um, to Santa's sled. And um, yeah, I'll see you very soon, Peter. And thanks for having me. Thanks, Ben. Thank you for joining us. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Ben as much as I did. Uh, Tune in next week. We're going to have an episode recorded at our Munich auction uh, at Motor World. And that is an incredible motoring emporium and so if uh, you get the chance to watch that episode when it comes out on YouTube it's worth doing just because it's an amazing environment and uh, yeah and in fact by the time you hear this I'm going to be en route to Munich because the auction is coming up very soon so tune in for that and I'll see you again. Mm -hmm.